Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Onco Daily. And uh, today uh, with our Onco influencers is Professor Tani Mok, a world known medical oncologist from Hong Kong. Uh, thank you very much for having a time for today's interview. And it's a great honor and pleasure for us. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So uh, recently I was interviewing Pasi Yane, and he suggested that the next uh, next one I should interview you. Why? What do you think? Well, because he's actually my uh, Western brother who works in Boston. So that basically we have been collaborating for over 20 years. Um, I can tell you one little story is that how we met. We were actually together at a quote unquote young investigator for lung cancer training course organized by AstraZeneca more than 20 years ago. It's a three annual event uh, in different parts of the world. And so we have been kind of say collaborating since we were quote unquote young investigator till now. So yes, it has been a long and deep relationship and we both focus on EGFM mutation and now on other uh, target therapy as well. And uh, together we have done a lot of good work. Uh, yeah, and when I emailed you, you said he's also your collaborator on food and wine. Oh, that is a more important collaboration. So, <laughs> you know, we go to meetings and then we have this formal dinner here, formal dinner there. But every time in a conference, we find one evening uh, together with a few other good friends, sometimes lunch, uh, so lunch Peter, sometimes others, that we just get together talk about everything else except oncology. We're just good friends, enjoying fine and companionship together, and then doing some gossip. So just like any normal human being would have wine and dine together. That is what we like to do and look forward to in ESCO and ESMO. Wonderful. Uh, then um, your bio starts, when I read your bio, it starts a bit different than usual bios. It starts, mm -hmm. Dr. Mo was trained at the University of Alberta and completed later on fellowship in medical oncology. So you basically start from like from this part, but usually the usual bios are different. Why? Right. It is an interesting story. I don't mind to share. So I finished my medical oncology training uh, in Princess Margaret, which is a high academic center uh, in Toronto. Um, at that time, I considered doing uh, academic uh, medicine. However, my son was born and it was very poor to be to do a continued fellowship in the laboratory. And, and then I don't want to do too much low come. So I decided, okay, what the heck, let me just do uh, community oncology. So which I did, I end up in Scarborough, which is a suburban area. A lot of Chinese living there. I was the only Chinese speaking oncologist in that area. So I become really quite busy very soon uh, as a community oncology. And I thought that I would spend the rest of my life as a community oncology at that time. But coincidentally, uh, in 1994, 95, I was in ESCO. I met someone from Hong Kong when he was presenting a poster. I see a Chinese name. I see a poster on XCC. I just go out and speaking in Cantonese. And so we just kind of, uh, you know, get to know each other and then, you know, the, uh, exchange call, uh, the, the, the phone number. And so 1995 Christmas, I returned home to visit my family in Hong Kong. I take the opportunity to visit him at the Chinese university. And long behold, he, his, his boss, Philip Johnson at that time, offered me a job two days later. So at that moment, I have no academic credential, zero publication. I was a community oncologist just because uh, I can speak Chinese and I can, uh, I'm a fully certified oncologist. They want me to join them. So that's how I started my career. But you may also want to ask, why did I make the decision to give up my big practice in Toronto and go back to yeah. Hong Kong? And actually, it took me two weeks to think about it. Of course, there are a lot of factors to consider. But to boil it down, there are two points. One is that if I stay in Toronto as a community oncologist, that is quite a bit of certainty. I know that I would do well. I know that I continue to have a lot of patients and etc. But then it is quite certain. But as compared, when I come back to Hong Kong, it is uncertain. I don't know what will happen to me and my life. So between certainty and uncertainty, I chose uncertainty at that time. So that's one point. And second, that was 1996. 
And as it turned out that 1997, Hong Kong will return to China. So I thought that would be an excellent opportunity for me to work with China. And so I, I did that. I come back to Hong Kong in 1996. And then 1997, the Hong Kong become part of China. In 1998, I start working with China. And so my career, a lot of my work is built in collaboration with China. So those are the two main reasons that drove my decision of coming back to Hong Kong, the uncertainty and then working with China. Wonderful. Uh, if, if you describe Tony Mok with one sentence, how you would describe it? Like if you write your bio, but there is a limit, one sentence. Well, no, no, it's like writing my obituary. What will I say in my obituary? <laughs> no, no, no. Right? So when I when I'm dead, I want people to remember that this is a an a uh, uh, oncologist with a funny hairdo or with a spiky hair and with a love of food and wine, but actually make a slight difference in the management of lung cancer during his lifetime. Wonderful. Uh, why you decided to become an oncologist? Oh, or that's a, another good story. That. I actually got a lot of this story like that. So um, that was back in 1986. Yeah. So I finished my uh, medical school in 84. And then I did three years of general medicine. So at that time, I kind of say like gastroenterology. Uh, the reason is that there's a lot of new gadgets at that time, you know, in a way of the endoscope and those new 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 things that you can play with, uh, with the GI. And then I also like oncology in a way is the fact that there is actually uh, facing life and death. And at that time, there's really nothing too much you know, that you can do with oncology. So my vision is that the thing that you got nothing to do with, there must be something you can do in the future. So those are the two areas that kind of attract me. So I was in Alberta, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's very cold. And then I decided to go to the top center in Canada to get the extra training. So the best GI training at that time is Queen's University, which is in Kingston uh, uh, of Ontario. And the oncology is the Princess Margaret in Toronto. So I flew over a red eye flight. I got interviewed in both places, in Queen's University and also in the Princess Margaret. And I got accepted both to GI and oncology. So how do I choose? It's actually very easy. There is a Chinatown in Toronto, but there's no Chinatown <laughs> in Queen's. <laughs> so you know, that, that, so that, that is as quickly as that. I, can, I need my Chinese food. So I, I got to have a Chinatown close by. So that's how I ended up with oncology. Yeah. Uh, what's the thing you are most proud of? Ah, so academic wise, you mean? Yeah. Or, or, or anything? I mean, you can answer both. Okay. So uh, academic wise is that, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough uh, to be able to contribute to the development of Mordecai Tiger therapy from the early on. In a way is that I was in the right place and the right time. Uh, you know, I back to Hong Kong in 1997, uh, uh, 96, and I start to build up the so-called the uh, uh, so-called the uh, study group uh, in Asia, and then the EGFL story break out in 2004, and EGFL turned out to be more common among the Asian population. So all of a sudden, the focus will be the development of the EGFL targeted treatment, and Asia become the hot place to do that, and I was just right in the right seat to be able to coordinate and help to the development. So the whole movement of the target therapy, I can be part of it. So this is one thing I'm proud of because, not because of the personal achievement, but rather the fact that I can see how this transformed the patient's life. Uh, you know, in a way is that you have to develop the drug, but in the same time, in the clinic, you see how the patient benefit the drug. Previously, lung cancer patient died very quickly. But now I do have patients who bring back the Christmas chocolate year after year after years. So one of my longest survivors is now in the 15 years since the start. That is one of my first uh, research patient. So this is how amazing it is, is that you will be able, how often that you can do something 
and able to help the mankind a little bit. So this is one thing that I'm quite proud of. Wonderful. Uh, and not academic ways? Not academic way is that, um, in, in, in a way is that I'm not excellent in anything, but I can be good in a lot of things. <laughs> So in a way of the diversity of things that I do. So, so yes, lung cancer research, but I can also be a doctor. I, 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 I very much you know, do a lot of our uh, drug development. So I sit on the board of director of AstraZeneca and a couple other company. Uh, so in the commercial sense, I have actually some experience. I also I had a startup company that which I developed in 2015, and then I uh, developed and then sold just recently. I, I also write column for newspaper. I also have TV show. So it's just my life is very diverse and rich that I got a bit of everything. Not good at, not excellent at everything, but kind of a bit of good in everything. <laughs> What's your TV show about? What's that again? What's your TV show uh, about? Oh, the TV show is a. It start off uh, as a health show because I was a doctor, so they want me to talk about general health problem. So we did it for two season. That I we got a bit bored. The third season, I say, why don't we food, do food and health? But it turned out to become totally a food show rather than a health show. So people see me as a a host for a food show in Hong Kong. <laughs> So it's a tough job. I have to go around different restaurants with three beautiful ladies, including a Miss Hong Kong, and then eat and talk. You know, I mean, it's a tough job. Well, very tough. <laughs> Everyone is going to be jealous <laughs> out once we publish this interview. <laughs> uh, you have a lot of awards, and but which one is the most important for you? Ah, uh, so. Each one got its meaning, but one that submitted the meeting, there are two that submitted the meeting well. Uh, one is the ESMO uh, Life Achievement Award. I'm most honored, uh, you know, in a sense, is that being recognized by a major international organization of my overall achievement in that. So that is a so called a what I call a submission thrice, in a way, it's a Life Achievement Award. The other one is actually the, the red one you see on the on my background. That is actually the uh, China National Science and Technology Prize. So it is actually a uh, China government uh, and, uh, uh, presented prize. It, you go to the major city hall in Beijing and presented by the leadership of China. And remember, my objective is to come back to work for, for China and then being able to have this award together with Yilong Wu is a co-shared between me and Yilong Wu. Just kind of state the fact that my vision of coming back to China is a realized. So those are the two, uh, to me, the you know most in impactful. Yeah, and also one other small one uh, that is actually uh, you know also in the background. Uh, that is uh, one of the best TV shows <laughs> award. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Yes, this one. <laughs> This one nice. is a uh, one of the best TV show awards. So I think it's unusual for oncologists to get a TV show award. Yeah, that's that's nice. I think that once we're interviewing Robert Peter Gale and he got Emmy. No, you know, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that I can't do. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. It's so, just a very local TV show. <laughs> so you are also on the board of preparatory school. So, I mean, mm. on the community where you are very active, right? So this is actually my alma manage? mater. Yeah, so so that is actually uh, the, the, my alma mater. And so it is actually a very nice boarding school uh, in Stanley, Hong Kong. Uh, it's a very picture style. I went there as a form four to form, form one to form four student, meaning from my age 12 to age 16. So basically, I developed myself in the four year boarding school there more than anything else in my life. You learn how to communicate with people, you learn how to live with people, you know how to discipline. And then I start to find my vision and then to find my goal of life in those four years in the, in the boarding school. So I really love the school. So when I got the opportunity, they invite me to, to be uh, one of the board of director, I immediately say yes. 
Uh, yes, it does take some time, but hey, serving your alma mater, I think this is actually yeah, uh, you know something very important to do. Uh, you work on, I mean, on developing uh, the clinical research infrastructure and in China and in Asia, and I mean, you said it's a very challenging and very rewarding work, but. How do you think, um, I mean, in general, there is a very huge di uh, disparity globally in the clinical research infrastructures. And recently there was also ASCO policy paper about it. So, I mean, what's your vision, how we can improve more this, uh, this I mean, make it a um, better place for, or like friendly place for the clinical research worldwide? Because it's it's a different story in right. uh, Canada, so, in uh, Hong Kong, and in other places. Um, yes, it's different uh, between country, but one common <clears throat> uh, point is the fact that it has to be a close collaboration with a pharmaceutical company. But the way I see research, clinical research, is like this: it is to address a scientific question. That is the objective of a clinical scientist or investigator. But then there are two other parties we have to take care. One is the patient. Patient want the best care, the best drug possible. And then there is the pharmaceutical company who need to have a commercialization. Otherwise, they cannot sponsor the trial. So when we develop clinical trial, we have to put all three parties' interests in place and then have a balance. So I can share with you the story about the IPAS study. The IPAS study is the randomized study of gefitinib versus the chemotherapy in a, a selected population, trying to prove EGFR as the biomarker. Now, at that time, uh, gefitinib was ex excluded from FDA, so they cannot, they got kicked out by FDA in short. So they can only develop the drug in Asia or Europe. Uh, that, that story is a bit complicated, um, but then in short is that they had the uh, so-called temporary registration, but then the ISO study, a third line study failed. It. So therefore FDA terminated the gefitinib registration. So <clears throat> when it comes to Asia, um, we need to do study for registration in Japan and China. Obviously those are the two biggest country. And, but then at that time, China actually do not have too much infrastructure to do a clinical trial. So my, one of my job is to be able to help to develop those clinical trial structure. Uh, it takes a lot of resources, but then the drug company had the incentive of doing that, the investment to build this structure so that they can do the clinical trial properly and so that they can get registration in the country. So doing that, Turn out that in China, if I remember correctly, there are about 20 to 30 centers. Some start off with good center, uh, because already those are the major center like we don't center, but there are some centers that are actually not very good. But in the process, because of this trial, it's important registration trial for AstraZeneca, we actually go to different center, help them to do GCP, help them to find a nurse, help them to do the infrastructure, and then make them into good condition. And so the trial was done. And turn out the quality of the trial is very good. But what happened up to that? What happened is that this 20-some center in China, after this, this study, they grouped together and become CITONG, Chinese Thoracic Oncology Group. Now it's become 46 center and become one of the major production of the multinational, multi-year center random mass study from China. So their infrastructure originate from building of a major multinational trial, but they carry on with the infrastructure and grew and grow from it. So I think it can happen to any country. Mm -hmm. It can happen to India. It can happen to, uh, you know, Turkey. I mean, you know, basically, as long as there is a incentive doing it and there's sufficient so-called uh, support to develop the infrastructure, it can be done. But then there has to be sufficient incentive for people to invest in that. Yeah. Uh, and how do you see the the future of 
I mean, I think it's a popular question, but the future of oncology, when we see this AI and a lot of developments right now, what, what's your vision about the future of oncology? Oh, I, I think we are in a very exciting time because we have two waves of success with the molecular target therapy and then with the immunotherapy, both are actually very success in lung cancer. And then both for the patient's care with the improvement survival, as well as financial success for the drug industry. So riding on this two wave, there will be the third and fourth wave. So one of this is already happening is the ADC, uh, another net new technology platform. Some success uh, may not be such a big wave as we like it for the time being, but then there is further modification of the ADC to make it better in the future. So I think the ADC rate can ride on even further. And then there is another wave that's coming uh, is similar to that is by specific. Uh, so there's already a, a, one by specific successful map, but I think there will be a few more by specific is going to come a, along the line. And then there's another whole separate category is the cell therapy and the cancer vaccine. And then all this, you know, will evolve AI in well, new technology, like the cancer vaccine, they have to use AI to interrogate the a genome uh, data to identify which is the new antigen. So all this a kind of technology integrated and turned into a technological based uh, treatment platform. And I think this wave is going to make a difference to the cancer care as well in the coming decade. Thank you. So. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, what's your key for, uh, for success? Oh. <laughs> so first of all, I, I, I don't know how I how to define success. You know, I never see myself as quote unquote success or not success. I like to life. And then uh, if I can make a difference, that may already be a success. And that, that give me joy and satisfaction to see, you know, the, give the patient target therapy, the tumor shrink, the poor effusion disappear. That give me happiness. And so in a sense is that you collect that piece of happiness and put it in your pocket. One scenario that I always uh, like to share uh, with my younger colleague is that uh, I think I'm like Super Mario. Super Mario start with a journey, and over the journey, he jump over barrier, take off the dragon, and collect coins. And to me, it's just collecting coin, collecting the moment of happiness, enough coin, eventually you got a score. It's a successful score, not it doesn't matter. I as long as collect enough coin of happiness, that will be the objective of my life. Wonderful. Uh what what are your top top books ah, which you would recommend? Reason or whatever. Okay, uh, reason one. Reason one. I read the the, the book by Mukherjee is the the Song of Selves. I really enjoyed it. Okay, it, it it is because he was able. He's an oncologist himself, and but he's a terrific writer, and he was able to get history of the, how the cell integrated in the health, uh, quite a bit of oncology involved. And then inside the book, there are people that I know. So it's a, you know, a very, very enjoyable, a very enjoyable uh, to, to read, you know, the story that, you know, you kind of, kind of part of the development as well. The song of cells. Wonderful. Uh, what advice you would give to uh, young oncologists? Okay, well, my 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 motto always is work hard, play hard, but this is generic. Uh, everybody should. Um, but but again, for the young oncologist, well, that that's just rather than talking about um what advice I gave them. Let me let's just talk. What are the barrier that they may face? Okay. Now my era of development, you know, from a younger one to the older uh, oncologist uh, is slightly different because we basically have little to start with. So any achievement uh, can be perceived as something very big. But now the overall achievement is bigger. 
So they may have to make bigger achievement. So for, for them to carry on, I think that there's a couple of so-called important um, uh, attitude, attitude. One is curiosity. So sometimes as oncologists, we're quite settled of what uh, we are being told as that this is the standard of treatment. But I think it's important to keep up the curiosity to say, hey, every so-called uh, uh, clinical scenario, there's a potential challenge. And always ask the question why and being curious that why does this happen? Why won't this happen? Why this patient survive for so long? Why will this patient progress so quickly? Keeping up that curiosity is important for you find, to find the next new thing to have the breakthrough. So that would be one of the so-called the advices I would suggest to the younger generation. Thank you so much. And uh, the last question, uh, what, uh, I mean, who, who, uh, who we should interview next? What would be <laughs> your advice? Okay, so which part of the world? Anywhere. Anywhere, um, lung cancer wise. Have you interviewed Solange, Peter? Uh, Passiani already suggested, so I sent an email. I haven't got response, but I'm sure she will. We will interview. Right. So, 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 now if you interview Solange, Peter, you have interviewed the the the, the brother and sister from Europe, United States, and Asia. <laughs> so you have <laughs> this trinity. <laughs> yeah, the complete this triangle with 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 with, with, with that. But then I think it may be interesting for you to interview uh, Professor Yi Long Wu. He is my China brother, and he is the really the top lung cancer person uh, in China. And he is uh, very influential. Uh, I think you should interview him to, for him to see his, uh, well, we kind of grew together. So a lot of story we share, but then he also got his inside story on the development of China. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Uh, I will email him and we'll ask for, for an interview. Uh, thank you so much. It was wonderful uh, interviewing you. And it was very, very interesting for me and very motivational. And I'm sure people are going to like it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's great to share my experience with you and the, your audience as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye-bye.